Um, yeah, I'm not actually going to talk about tattoos. thought I was, but changed my mind. So, um, um, but I'm going to look at some of the, the weirder and stranger realms of identity politics, um, f starting from the point of some of Marx's early view writings on, on alienation. Because um, I think in those writings, which came at a time when the contradiction between the individual and society was starting to become more apparent, and he was very much emphasizing that and seeing that as having um, an objective basis in, in social life. Um, I think that those, the, the tension that he highlights is very useful for us to understand contemporary forms. So I think that some of the kind of weirder and, and wackier forms of identity politics, which I'm sure, you know, maybe not be represented in this room, but um, I think in those forms you can see a very particular working out of a relation between the self and, and, and the general or the social form, um, which in my mind is an accentuation of the sort of things that he was, he was highlighting. Um, when he was 25, it, it must be said. Um, so really, the, the basis of his, his critique is, um, is not actually being against the, the, the individual at all. I think there's often an idea that he's you know, against privacy and self-interest and all that kind of thing. Um, uh, but I think it, it's actually highlighting the particular form taken by the individual and the social under capitalism and the way in which um, the individual is estranged from his social being on the one hand, but also the forms taken by the social are estranged from individuality. Um, and so you tend to get these, these separations into two quite um, contradictory areas of life or areas of thought or areas within an individual themselves um, which don't really relate to one another um, and are quite external to one another. So on the one hand, he, he highlights the, you know, the form taken by the individual in, in, in kind of capitalist civil society as being merely kind of immediate and sensuous and self-seeking. Um, he, he talks about the Jewish type a lot, and so the, basically they're kind of just trying to get out for everything you can get and seeing everything and everyone as an obstruction to that and having a very narrow relationship to the world, to the material world as well. So he talks about seeing you know, the, a mineral just from the point of view of what's it worth to me, what can I get out of it, and not from its min mineral mineralogical sense or its beauty or all the different aspects of an object are sort of effaced and to see things only from a sort of one-sided um, point of view of practical need. So both others and also the material world become merely a means to your own betterment or, or self-sustaining. Um, in this he's not being critical of the individual as such but a, a particular narrow form which actually is restrictive of individuality and, and the development of one's powers in an all-rounded manner and the development of one's relationships to others and to the world in, in, a, in, a, kind of, in, a, in, a, in a complete and, 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 and kind of um, meaningful way. So on the one hand, there's this, this sort of particular individual. On the other hand, there's, there's a realm of, of social abstraction, um, whereby the social, the social realm, the, the, the kind of general whatever, appears not as something that the individual has made or that they... Um, contributed to, but almost as a kind of natural force um, existing apart, apart from them. Often that they can't fathom, so it kind of exists as a sort of naturalized, naturalized realm, which obviously the market is one of the forms of that, but it takes all sorts of forms, um, forms of the state often very kind of opposed to, to individual and individual will. So you get this sort of, um, that, that sort of split, and the example he gives of this is in... Um, of alienated labor. So the way that somebody can, can be working, you know, putting their energies, their talents, their abilities into, into an action, um, but this experience is something external to themselves. So their labor is experienced not as something that they're in charge of, but as something that um, is accountable to some other person or some other force. Um, and so the thing that he has made appears to have no connection to him. It appears something to be outside of him, external to him, and hostile to him. And so even in the act of creation, which is the most um, intimate expression of the self, in that he is, um, he is almost self-sacrificing. Um, so, so really, it, it's, it's the way in which, for the individual, um, his social life it, it is experienced as merely a means to his own 
existence, but also his individual powers become merely a means for other external forces. So you have these two realms of, of immediacy and abstraction, and each is almost um, the means to the other, so both sacrifice to one another. And um, Metsaros contrasts this to the way that individual and society existed uh, for Aristotle. So Aristotle didn't really see any contradiction between what was good for a person and what was good for the state. They were both kind of the same sort of nature, and all different bodies of, of, the, of the social um, had that kind of unity of they were all in it together. Um, so, so the thing that Marx is hi highlighting is a very particular form of development at a particular, particular time. So he talks about in, um, it's a Jewish question, he talks about on the one hand you have an egoistic individual, on the other hand an abstract citizen. So on the one, one hand you, you know, you're kind of um, self-seeking and everything in, in society. On the other hand, you have the abstract citizen, so someone like the bureaucrat, who is completely effaced of any kind of individuality. They're a kind of cog in the machine and they just have to put all personality at the door so you have the kind of abstraction of the state and then the immediacy of, of the citizen. Um, Metzaros says, he says this, this split takes lots of forms in terms of the realms of capital and the realms of, of consumption. So on the one hand, essentially numbers and the market. On the other hand, sensual, immediate gratification of need. Or the split between public and private. Um, it also takes the form of between particular, particularism and abstraction. So on the one hand, you get a narrowing down of things to the most immediate level possible, just seeing it, sorry, from the um, smallest, most immediate perspective. On the other hand, you get forms of generality that are completely devoid of any kind of quality or, or particular um, experience. So you get lots of, um, new, lots of numbers and lots of impersonal forces that, that don't pay any attention to particular details. You know, or on the one hand, voluntari voluntarism and naturalism. So on the one hand, the idea that you know, the individual is completely free to whatever they like. But on the other hand, the idea that the world is determined by natural forces. Um, <clears throat> and I think that the, he highlights the origin of this contradiction is existing in the fact that the individual is only indirectly social under capitalist society. So whereas under feudalism, the way in which you would um, uh, exchange money or services was essentially as a consequence of your personal relations to other people. So you owed certain things to your lord. You know, it, was, it was your lord, and uh, you were his serf. And the, the, the exchanges you had were a consequence of your personal relations to one another. Whereas under capitalism, the, the, ex, the social exists only as the outcome behind the backs of private exchanges, and not something that is intended in the act of exchange. So it comes about as a separate sphere that's different in nature to the moment of things changing hands. So that, so that he, he kind of, um, so that's the kind of the, the, the origin of this, this contradiction. And this highlighting of um, the contradiction between individual and social was very much drawing a line under, under social contract theorists, natural law theorists, which very much assumed a unity. So they assumed that if everybody goes around pursuing their own interests, then the social good will result of that, as a, as a result out of that. So it was sort of assumed to be the things that were inherent in the individual work, sort of general principles and, and, and laws. Um, so it was assumed to be a harmony. So M Marx is very much critiquing that, but he's also critiquing Hegel, <coughs> because Hegel does highlight in many ways the f tensions between the forms taken by the individual and the forms taken by society. But um, he's always um, unifying this contradiction. So he talks about the fact that actually, if you look at the development of the individual, then the moment at which conscience appears and the deepest inner of experience is the moment at which um, that inner is, is absolutely universal. So you have the deepest inner that's also the most universal. And this is what conscience is. Conscience, in it, as much as it's substantial, it has those two elements. If you take one element away, you don't actually have the idea of conscience anymore. You don't actually have, a, have the idea of, of, of what is the individual. Um, similarly, if you look at forms of, of, of state or law or whatever, Hegel says that these are not um, outside the individual, but they're reflective of his will. So if someone's being punished, 
uh, or they have to go to war and they have to fight for the state. That is not them serving something outside of themselves, but it's serving something that is a reflection of them. So the thing that gives under capitalism the, the state its form or law its form, all these forms of generality, is supposed to be that they reflect the individual will. And if you take that away, then, then they don't have that, that substance. Um, so Marx is, is, is kind of critiquing Hegel and saying, but actually um, the contradictions you're highlighting are, are not resolvable under the current system. And he's saying, he criticizes Hegel's middle terms. So Hegel always wants to synthesize everything. He kind of sets up an opposition here, an opposition there, and he kind of wants to unite it. And Marx is saying basically these are false um, resolutions and that actually the things that, you're, the things that Hegel is um, identifying as contradictory are actually contradictory in reality, according to the basis of social relations. So that's the kind of background. I think that if you look um, now, in many ways, the sorts of things that were being highlighted in, in, in this, <coughs> in this um, theory, um, I think in many ways you can see our contemporary social forms as expressing in an extreme manner that underlying tension. I think you can see um, increasingly um, one-sided forms of immediacy and particularism on the one hand, and abstraction and generality on the other. So people, um, on the one hand, um, reducing everything to the most immediate and personal level. And on the other hand, these vague, naturalized, estranged um, forces. And that these two levels of immediacy and abstraction, I think, exist increasingly in a way that's oppositional and con conflictual towards each other. <clears throat> and yeah, looking at some of the stranger forms, such as you know, people um, not wanting to be called he or she, or um, trans transgenderism perhaps, or I think that in many ways um, these forms, uh, you can see very, very distinct uh, mediations of the relationship between partic particular and the general. So micro microaggressions, for example, um, this is an example of the way in which people experience their identity as a self as being something essentially in conflict with the social realm. So if you go on these websites, basically people saying, oh, somebody asked me where I was from. And this is kind of seen as an aggressive act because they were implying that I wasn't from there or, um, you know, or, or they said something like, um, you, don't like the kind of, you don't look like the kind of person to be interested in sports. And this was a sort of aggressive act because I'm you know, overweight or whatever it was. But on these things, there is a way in which the individual experiences the social encounter itself as a slight. So the kind of interaction of someone saying, what's your name, where are you from, is experienced as something completely hostile to the self and as the basis of their unraveling. The same thing I think you get with um, gender neut neutral identities. It's people saying they're not he or she. They don't want to be called he or she. They don't identify with he or she. And I think behind this is really an objection to being touched by anything social, any general category. You know, to say that you're going to be lumped in with a general group of people, um, a man or a woman. And so it's an objection to anybody else naming, naming you, to being um, put in part as of any kind of general general system. An objection to people making assumptions about who you are or, or what you are. And so they want their own unique language, which has as its substance the violation of language. They want to be called um, Z, was it Z? I don't know. Um, they, Co. And essentially the demand is that they're called these other terms rather than he or she. Um, which is basically saying that they want to be recognized in a way that is completely hostile to the general kind of social terms. And it really starts out at this feeling of being misunderstood, of the real you being the opposite of what people think of as you, or being wanting to be called the thing that's the opposite of what people call you. So that, I think, what, what you see on the one hand is this, is forms of the self being increasingly sensitive to, hostile to, um, objecting to the, the, the social realm, the social ascription. But on the other hand, you get, I think you get forms of, of the social that are increasingly oppositional to the individual. Um, you know, I think you get forms of, of the state and of 
general, um, general principles that basically are, are, don't have any room for, for the individual will, or in fact are completely defined against that. And so the category of globalization, for example, um, whereby the kind of general social force is just like a natural, like a storm or something that just uh, kind of moves through the world, changing things. People don't really understand it. It's kind of unintelligible as a concept. It's not grounded in any social particularity like nation or state or anything like that. It's a sort of general move that, that sweeps throughout things and makes things happen. Um, and you also see this in, in areas of policy making, which is something I looked at in my book. Um, and you have forms of state policy which, and, and, and rulemaking and that sort of thing, which are defined simply by the fact that they are, are, are defined against um, people's free action. So, so the ideal of state policy is it reflects the wills of people, etc. And what you find now is, is you have state policy that has no justification other than that it's not free. You know, so you have policies that have no basis other than the fact that they restrict people from doing the things they want to do. You know, so there's no rationality, there's no way in which this represents a general kind of assumption about what you should do. Um, so whether that's the um, you know, idea that you should uh, only touch people in a, children in a particular way or, or you should only take photographs in a particular way or you should have to register your camera before you take photographs. You know, in all these ways, you have a, a policy form that has no intrinsic rationality except for its negation of the rationality of the individual. Um, and, so, and so I think that the tension that Marx was highlighting and saying, look, there's a real, a real contradiction between state and individual. In a way, that contradiction has moved, moved to an open and barefaced line whereby each defines itself against the other and is something entirely exclusive um, of the other. Yeah, I mean, nudge is a very good example of that as well. You know, the idea that that um, policymakers should, should, should affect individuals' choices without them knowing. So deliberately avoiding the moment of actually engaging with people's will or volition or opinion. So it's a deliberate separation between the realm of universal policymaking, which decides on what is the general good, what is the right thing, and the realm of individual decision-making, which is assumed to be entirely partial. And there's a deliberate attempt to not relate one to the other. Um, so, um, so the, and, 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 and in fact, when you look at what they're saying and the kind of content of nudges and that sort of thing, again, it's not a um, not terribly wise philosophy, but it's mainly it's only based only on the as the negation of the belief that it, people do not know, do not know, know what they're doing. So, the authority of the nudger comes only as a negation from the, the um, irresponsibility or or lack of foresight of individuals themselves. <coughs> Um, so I think you get this increasing separation of, 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 of elements into, into, on the one hand, the particular over here, on the one hand, the universal over here. Um, and you know, I think in many ways this is a consequence of the sorts of mediations that Hegel was highlighting as being um, the basis for the relationship between the individual and the society and the different groups in society. I think that in many ways it's the breakdown of those mediations which mean that, that things start to take this, this increasing abstract and one-sided form. When you see social phenomena that contain the moments of the individual and the social, um, these sort of exist as unrelated and sort of pinned together. So rather than bound together, they exist as sort of pinned. So someone might say, um, I identify as a queer woman of colour or... QWOC. There's a lot of uh, ac acronyms and uh, letters around. They get longer and longer. Um, I think that's interesting. I identify as a QWOC um, because essentially in that phrase you have the moment of volition, I identify as, and then you have the moment of reification or abstraction, a QWOC. And the, I the identification is, is sort of linking them together, but it's not to say I am, you know, to say I am Labour, I am Liberal, I am British, those things, I am says I am in my core, you know, as an individual I am a unity of this general social category, but that I identify as basically says my identity, um, my volition is over here and, and this, this general category over there, which is actually relatively impersonal and unrelated to the inner 
um, of the self and the inner substance of the self. People also say, rather than um, <coughs> defining themselves in terms of particular qualities, um, they'll define themselves in terms of categories. So, you know, rather than saying I'm outgoing or I'm assertive or whatever, they'll sort of say I'm, you know, I'm a, a top or I'm a dominant or there's a kind of a categorization of things that would have been seen as, as a quality, as a kind of aspect of, of an individuality or a person, um, become, um, become essentially a box that you then slot yourself into. Um, and I think it's significant that, that assuming an identity category isn't about um, really your relations to others. So, you know, when I was young, essentially, if you joined an identity category, you'd go to lots of bars of that particular identity category and you'd listen to a particular kind of music and essentially it would be a social scene, whether that was a gay scene or a punk scene or whatever. But it would mean you're joining a particular community of people who were pursuing that, that way of life. And I think that now someone becoming an identity or becoming a particular kind of self um, is some a relationship between them and a category they have chosen. So they don't go to any bars. Um, they don't listen to particular kinds of music. It's, a, it's, it's um, them choosing their box. And so it's the relationship between the volition, the moment of volition and, and, the, and the kind of moment of, of a box to choose. <clears throat> Um, I think I'd go to so far as to say that um, what we have in a way is not the individual and the social anymore um, as kind of determinate phenomenon. Um, I think Hegel was absolutely right when he said that the determinacy of something comes from the contradictions within it. So an individual being determinate is because they have the universal with them, within them. The social being determinate is because it has the individual within it. I think that was absolutely right. And I think that the, the breakdown of those mediations mean that we no longer have the social as a substantive thing or the individual as a substantive thing. Um, so you no longer get, you kind of read books on social roles or the conflicts between the individual and society in the 50s. And the way they talk about society is very much as this substantive body sort of imposing itself upon the individual will and you know, demanding certain things of you and casting you into a mold. And often the individual being frustrated with that and wanting to fight it off and wanting to be their own person. But they were facing a, a, a body that they had substance. It had particular channels and shapes and was trying to get them to you know, become respectable and have a profession and have a wife and do all these things. Um, so they very much, people like Darendorf or, or Simmel, they very much talk about... Um, the society is wanting something, one thing, and individuals is wanting something else. And those things are sort of fighting each other, but as two quite concrete and determinate kind of things. So the individual would be thinking, you know, I want to be a beat, or I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be a lawyer. And, um, you know, and kind of fighting that, that kind of structure of social roles and patriarchal authority and that kind of stuff. So I think that no longer exists, as people don't encounter the social something determinate forcing them down particular lines of, of action or, 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 um, or existence. But at the same time, I think the individual doesn't exist as something autonomous in the same way. Um, you know, it's not like people are kind of going off and reflecting and trying to um, uh, be entirely independent from others. The, the, the identity politics self exists only in the moment of being seen by others, in that kind of the moment of recognition or, um, or the relation to others. And so really the content of that, of the gender neutral identity being asked to be called Z or, or they or whatever, you're asking to be seen in the opposite way to the way others see you. You're asking to be recognized as the antisocial form. So in a way your identity has no content except for um, a rejection of the social, so you want them to call you. You want them to call you something that violates social meaning, but you have no existence aside from the way that you're seen. It's all about the way you're seen, the way you're seen in the mirror, the way you're seen by others, the way that you're named it exists in that plane. 
So I think because, in a way, you can say that the, the abstract and the particular have become not really embodied in social individual as such, but have become almost like naturalized substances. Um, so something like, you know, your emotion is like a, a kind of naturalized force that plays out through you. And at the same time, social, you know, globalization or all the demands of, um, of society are naturalized forces that play out with you. And so I think that the elements of the particular and universal have become objectified into substances. Um, so instead of the two elements of social reality existing as definite social forms, which are mediated with one another and expressions of will, instead you have naturalized one-sided substances that play out through the individual, something independent of their will. A couple of final points on the way this, this happens. Um, I think that this is not a spontaneous process, but it's very much something that people are driving um, consciously and, and, and seeking to, to accentuate. Um, so people very much, in forms of culture and forms of policy making, they will the increased estrangement between the particular and the, and the abstract. Um, so you see very much uh, an experiencing of, of, of social relations, so family or the demands of... Um, of your partner or lover or whatever, as, as a restriction on the self or as something that's toxic. So people talking about, um, so in Frank's book on therapy culture, talking about the, the thing of people seen as loving too much. You know, you're too tied in with people or you invest too much. And, and the sensible thing is to withdraw from those relations. So those relations are experienced as, as a, a kind of toxic thing that you seek, seek to withdraw from. Um, all the phenomenon of, of the jihadi identity that I talked about a bit last year, you know, were very much the basis for the jihadi identity and the way in which they see themselves as becoming the real them um, is only a, a, a negation of every social relationship of which they're part. So they hate absolutely everything. They hate the mosque network, they hate their parents, the family, they hate modern society, they hate their neighborhoods. And there is this, this and the, the jihadi identity is, is a, has no basis except as a complete negation of all social relations. So they're seeking um, this sort of abstract brotherhood, which has no content except its opposition with all forms of, of social um, sociality. And that abstract brotherhood obviously ultimately is, is related to their self-destruction as individuals and their, their offering of, them, of themselves. <clears throat> so I think that very much we through our culture, we will to increase our alienation and to accentuate the contradiction between the, the forms taken by the particular and the universal. So it's not like this, it's just working out in some kind of inevitable way. It's very much culture is seeking this as an end. Um, and I think this relates a bit to what Marx was talking about when he talked about the way in which things appear in the opposite form to the way they really are. So, um, you know, he says that labor or work is, is, is the expression of the human essence. It's what you are. It's, it's, it, it kind of defines your, your existence. But the more you work, the more you experience that as a wasting of you. The more you make, the emptier you appear. So there's a way in which the thing that is really you appears as the thing that's taking you from yourself. And so as a result, um, man experiences... Uh, non-work as his real self. So he experienced his being at home or engaging in animal functions of eating and drinking or whatever. Those are his, his unalienated life. And um, his work when he's actually working in concert with others as his alienated life. Um, so things appear in an inverted manner and the thing that's actually fake appears as true. The thing that's actually true um, appears as fake. So I think that's, that, that's very much happening now in terms of people, the thing that is actually the basis of their identity and their self-sustenance in terms of their collaborative relations to others is experienced as the source of their lack of belonging. And so they, they seek to distance themselves from that, but as a result seek the alienated state. <coughs> um, right, the final point really is on the way in which... Um, I think very much now you can see that the estrangement between the individual and the social is also driven by an increased role of the mediator. 
um, in social relations. I think that we, have, we are very much the age of the mediator now, you know, the therapist, um, the bureaucrat, um, the technology in many ways. And so people relate increasingly, not directly as individualities, but essentially through um, external forms that um, determine the context of and the, and the course of that, that relationship. Um, so, for example, you know, identity categories actually form this sort of uh, role, perform this sort of role. Apparently, on dating websites, um, people kind of say what category they are, so whether you're top or bottom or whatever. Um, and essentially, the, the website then becomes a matching of categories. And so the meeting between two individuals is not a consequence of two individualities, essentially experience, union, or chemistry, whatever that's based on, whether that's people being different or the same or whatever. Um, instead, it's a kind of scientific process um, between people's self-identification with categories. Um, I saw an ad on the tube yesterday saying, um, for a dating website saying, you know, we've done the, the science of chemistry, so you don't have to. You know, so in a way, like, we've figured out all the, um, we've figured it out as a system, so you don't have to relate. Um, and so I think that, you know, people do say, oh, I said I was pansexual and she said she was asexual right from the start and that's how we introduce each other. And they apparently say together, which doesn't seem very, um, <laughs> very promising, but apparently they had an agreement that it worked out okay. Um, but, um, you know, I think that that kind of relationship to others through a category, so you relate to the category and through the category to other people, is quite like Marx's um, concept of commodity fetishism in terms of you relate um, to the commodity and through the commodity to other people. Um, you know, or sex toys as well, I guess, in terms of relating through an object. Um, so, yeah, in the conclusion, I think that in many ways, I think you can f see the forms taken by the weirder forms of identity politics today as being expression of this increasingly accentuated split between the realms of the particular and the general or the abstract, um, um, as, as kind of described from Marx. And this is not a, a spontaneous process, but something very much that cultural life wills and seeks, and seeks to accentuate. So I think that there's very much a role for opposing this process and for defending um, the genuine forms of mediation against their attack and defending forms of one-to-one -one exchange um, and very much criticizing the mediator in relations, you know, supporting the direct relation rather than the, the form that goes through um, you know, a scientific system or some kind of external object. <laughs>